Oh, we've got some people coming in here, which is nice to see. So how are you today, James? Very good. Doing doing great. What's the weather like in your neck of the woods? We're in New York. Uh, it's pretty cold. We had a little bit of snow this morning, which covers our probably week of snow from last week. We have a white blanket on everything. I know. It's crazy. You guys are so, you know, we're based in Toronto or just outside of Toronto. And we've had almost no snow this year. It's crazy. We had a beautiful blanket of snow over the holiday. And then it's really been pretty mild. I mean, it's gotten a little colder this week, but we've not really had any snow to speak of. And you've had a ton. So we had a ton. We hit a hit a record this year already. Wow. Yeah. And now are you right in the city? I am in uh, Queens, New York, in Sunnyside, New York, which is in New York City. It's just out of the center of New York. Right. Right. Oh, very good. Very good. And how is the city these days? How are you finding it? Quieter? Uh, is well, it I mean, again? well, we'll see. Things are pretty quiet right now in New York. Um, it's the quietest I've ever, ever seen it. But uh, there seems to be optimism. Um, a lot of shops are closed, but um, hopefully things will turn around this spring. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's hope so. I mean, you know, um, we can only hope and, and um, you know, as crazy as it is, um, I think a lot of us in the industry have seen an uptick, you know, based on, I mean, you must be super busy right now with people redoing their spaces and, and so yep. on. Yeah, exactly. We're, there's always work to be done. Um, and since people have been staying home, they kind of look at their own spaces more and develop their projects a little bit more. And kind of there's an urgency to do their projects. Right. I hadn't seen before. So some this is a development from start to finish seems to be a little bit faster these days. Yeah, we're seeing that too. And we're also seeing a lot of um, you know, longer lead times with manufacturers, depending on where the product is coming from. I know the UK for us has been a bit of a nightmare with their rolling shutdowns and so on. And, you know, so deliveries are a little stalled and and um you know, it just, I mean, it is what it is, I guess, but I know it frustrates our customers, that's for sure. Yeah, but I think people are a little bit more thoughtful about their projects, so they're more deliberate in what they're planning. Right. Um, expectations are kind of more focused than they had been in recent years. Right, so right. Some upsides to all of this. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, oh, I see lots of people coming in. James, you're a popular guy. I am chatting today with James Arnold. And I have to tell you, this man is a true artist. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about James when we get everybody in here. But um, just so interesting. I told James that I could just you know, spend the whole webinar just talking about everything he's done in his life, never mind the the artist that he is and, and the work that he's done. Um, so I think you're really going to get a lot out of this today. I'm so happy that you've joined us. I know it's been a while since we've done a webinar. We thought we'd take a little break. Everyone was kind of getting back to work and trying to figure out what the, the year looked like for them, but we're back at it and, you know, going to give you another year of um, hopefully a lot of education, um, maybe a little levity, um, and, um, and then some really good product as well. So put your name or your, um, your place where you're coming from in the chat. We always love to hear. We have Becky saying hi from North Carolina. Um, and then Francine says clients are doing a lot of interior and exterior projects and she's in South Carolina. So um, yeah, that's absolutely true. And um, we've got some questions for you as our audience, um, as we um, you know, go through the webinar, just love to get your opinion on a few things. So um, we'll put some polls up and hopefully you can answer the questions in the polls to help us um, gain a little more information and insight as to you know, what you're feeling about the topic. Um, and it's also nice just to um, have you to be able to participate. So my name, for those of you who've not joined us before, my name is Lisa Nickel. I'm the Senior Vice President of Sales and Marketing for JF Fabrics. And today I am chatting with James Arnold. And James is um, uh, lives in New York and um, he uh, is a wallpaper installer, which seems actually 
oversimplified um, because James is really, when you see his work and when you hear what he's done, he's, an, he's a true artist. And um, just amazing um, what, um, how, what brought him to where he is today. And I'm gonna share that with all of you. So we'll just wait for a few more of you to come in. Oh, we've got Aaron from Belleville. That's here in Ontario. We've got Susan from Naples, um, Brenda from uh, Toronto. That's great. Arena from North Carolina. We've got people everywhere. So, um, oh, someone from Montreal, someone from Florida, Marco Island. Have you done any work there, James? Not Marco Island, but I've been to Palm Beach. And um, is Marco Island's on the I think west? It's on the coast? west. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've done mostly uh, west, east coast uh, of Florida. Right. Well, that would make sense because if your clients are mainly in the New York City area, they kind of flock more to the East Coast, right? So there's a lot of transfer from New York right. to Florida. Yeah. Right. Now I understand. Oh, we've got someone from Halifax. Wow. Now, have you um have you had a lot of I've heard a lot of um people from the East Coast, the Northeast are actually moving to Florida. Have you have any clients that have actually moved? Not specifically. I, I think that's kind of, uh, th they say that like New York and Florida are the same place. Uh, there's a lot of uh, communication between the two. So it's very, it's very common to hear, oh, I'm going to Florida. Some people have a second home there. Right. So they do back and forth. Right. It's not, it's not any more now than it was. Actually, it might be a little bit quieter talking about that now, but I think it'll continue to happen. Right. Right. Well, we're going to get started because we're going to have a jam packed webinar today. And I can assure you that um, it's going to be um, filled with tons of great information and some really, really interesting information as well. But before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about our guest today. So uh, James Arnold is the founder of Hudson Wallcraft Inc. And um, he has, um, he's been doing this for a number of years. Um, he began, actually, he has a fine arts uh, painting, sculpture, drawing, and art history. He studied that at Parsons in New York, um, in addition to a BFA at the School of Visual Arts in New York. And that was in 1993. Um, James studied with many great artists. Um, and um, he's going to tell you a little bit about that as well. Um, and so James really got his start. Uh, he began as a um, working with his uncle. He and his brother actually uh, through high school, I think, uh, began working with his uncle um, in 1985 and 1986. And that's really um, where he got a start as an installer. His uncle um, was a commercial wallpaper hanger in Manhattan. Um, and his uncle worked from the 1960s all the way through to the 1990s. And he really taught James and his brother how to work um, in upscale corporate commercial environments, hospitality, residential, and so on. Um, and James, I know um, James and I have spoken before and, and he's uh, mentioned how fortunate he feels to have been able to work with some of the, the old timers. Um, um, who were really accomplished high-end commercial wallpaper hangers in, in New York City. So um, when while James was at college, he, um, he worked with um, his uncle, of course, as we mentioned, but he also took a position at a um, high society, kind of a benefit catering company in New York City. Um, and then when he graduated, his first goal was to become more involved in, um, um, in art making or curating. Um, so he took a job um, at the Met. And I guess his hope there was to um, find a curator or an art installer position that could get him on to his next really good position. But he soon realized this is going to be very tedious and boring along the way. Um, so James kind of took a, an about face and, um, you know, I guess he watched his uncle and his 
brother making quite comfortable lives installing wall covering and um and it allowed them a lot more free time as well so this got james thinking and uh, he went to his uncle and begged he and his brother to allow them to join um, they were reluctant because they didn't feel that james could um succeed in the i think the term was in the blue collar world right james um right. So, um, but he thought differently and he thought, well, what if I brought my talent and my education in the art world um, to the, um, to the, um, the work as a, his work as a paper hanger. So uh, he began and he worked originally or initially with um, his family through larger contractors. He worked for uh, Morgan Stanley, Dean Witter, Pfizer, Merrill Lynch, um, and even Lehman Brothers. Um, as he started to excel, he realized that he was the one who was being asked to um, do the work in all the corner offices and all the um, executive offices um, of all the, um, you know, CEOs, all the people who ran the, the uh, companies that he worked for. And then he soon realized that these people would want similar work done in their homes. So he um, really started to get noticed. Um, and then he had companies actually sourcing him to kind of be a troubleshooter and solve problems on um, other jobs um, and also to do some testing for, for them. So uh, James is really making a name for himself. And it was through this um, that he thought he would start his own business. So after partnerships in two previous companies, uh, he finally incorporated his own, which is what it is today, which is Hudson Wallcraft. And that was in 2010. So James keeps a small team of uh, paper hangers. Um, they do many um, private industry clients um, and they are word of mouth. James does not advertise, he prefers not to. Uh, his name and his work speaks for himself and how fortunate he is. Um, that that is the case. So his goal really is to take projects that have a wide, use a wide range of materials, hoping to push the boundaries of what, um, what can work on interior settings. So we are here with James Arnold today. James, welcome and thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. So um, just before we get started, um, James is going to bring us through a presentation that really kind of shows us um, you know, what um, kind of the pitfalls and the flaws and the, the issues that can occur uh, during an installation. Um, but before we do, I just want to ask you a few questions. So tell me a little bit about where you've traveled. I understand you've traveled all over for your craft. So the furthest, uh, the furthest trip we took was to Saudi Arabia. Uh, we worked in a palace in Riyadh. It's about eight years ago. Um, that was, I, that's pretty hard to top that experience. Um, I brought five installers with me. We spent a month working in this tremendous building, um, which was just that's amazing. amazing. Um, we, we were talking earlier about, you know, your customers who are in New York. So I know often they ask you to go to their, you know, vacation homes or other second homes to do work there as well. Yes. Yeah, so just in New York, uh, there are many people that'll have they'll have a, an apartment in New York City, and then they'll have another place out in the country somewhere. Usually, there's like three different stages of where that could be. Like it'll be within a drive, an hour or two drive of New York, and then very often they'll have places like the the ski house or the beach house. Um, so it's very often that we'll work for one client and do multiple projects for their different places where they might have a house. Wow. And then I know that, you know, you've worked with all these wonderful people as well. So, I mean, in terms of designers um, that, you know, New York designers, who have you worked with? Um, early on, I worked with uh, Terry Despont, um, who actually, they did the renovation for the Statue of Liberty as wow. a French design architect. Um, and I started doing a few projects with them. Um, I worked with Annabelle Seldorf at the World Trade Center, the old World Trade Center at Windows on the World. Uh, we did a, a lot of residential projects for her after that. Um, and then later on, I worked with Tony Ingrau for a long time um, doing, he was like one of my main, main 
clients that I worked for. Uh, and we did a lot of great projects with him. Yeah, I can imagine his work. I mean, how exciting to actually see, you know, his vision through your hands come to life. I mean, some some amazing things. And I think um, the folks that are joining us today are going to see some of those amazing, amazing things in the presentation that we have. Now, I know um, that you've also done some work in some pretty interesting places. Um, can you tell us a little bit about about those places? In what sense? I mean, there's, I, I have a lot of range. Um, the residential projects, like the upscale residential projects can be really interesting because the clients have, they have a budget to play with sometimes. They want to, they want to set a stage for themselves. So they'll try to seek out unique materials and, and their spaces are usually well designed. So we'll try to do, um, you know, very often like handmade materials or we'll take materials that are more manufactured, but we'll cut them into parts to try to lay them out a certain way so that they have like a different interior, so they have a unique different interior. Wow, and um, any celebrities, James? Uh, there's a couple um, that I've worked for. It's not so great to, usually they like their privacy. So it's not so great. We can kind of allude to who they are, but we try to protect their their privacy a little bit. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to let you off the hook, but um, you can tell me afterwards privately, and I promise not to tell. <laughs> um, but you've also done some work at you know some pretty popular places. I think you did work at the MoMA, did you not? Yeah, I did some work at uh, at PS One, which is this MoMA Museum, and and they have a, a satellite branch PS One. There, I I could mention this. I worked for uh, Barbara Kruger who's an artist, she's the artist who designed that Supreme. Have you ever seen the, that's kind of showing up everywhere, but she's a great yeah. artist and she's done a lot of murals. So I did a few murals for her at PS1. Um, I worked for uh, Red Grooms, uh, who's another artist in New York. Uh, I did an installations at Natural History Museum in New York. They have a, this one famous room, it's the Whale Room. And the whale room is like kind of internationally known and they have all these vignettes which have these backdrops. So we installed a bunch of the backdrops for these vignettes. And I think, did you tell me as well, Tiffany's and Hudson Yards? Tiffany's, uh, we did a few showrooms for them in New York, which they're constantly changing. They'll renovate their spaces every couple of years. There's like the famous breakfast is Tiffany's, but they have several floors upstairs where the showrooms get uh, turned over. Right now it's under a major renovation, um, but it's it's kind of a cool place to work in there. Wow. Wow. Well, and I think there's a few others like uh, the Rainbow Room, I think you've done, AOL, Time Warner. Um, so I, I, you've you've certainly done some, some very um, kind of uh, famous and, and noted um, establishments. So that's, I mean, that's incredibly exciting. And then tell us just a little bit before we get into the presentation about um, the catering work that you did. So when I was young, when I was young, I was in, in college and it was in New York. At that time, someone in their late teens and 20s could survive in Manhattan on their own. Um, one of the ways I did, I did it was to have multiple projects, multiple jobs going on. Right. Um, and I ended up through friends of friends working for a catering company where they did high society parties. They would do benefits at um, like all the museums and, and at the public library, New York Public Library, where they would, it was like the benefit where it's like $1,000 a plate, $3,000 a plate. So all these like very well healed people would show up and have dinners and um, ha like getting to see that was like pretty dramatic. They, uh, we used to do work at the Met Opera at Lincoln Center. I'm um, sorry, I saw these like very elaborate events where there was like no cost was spared um that that we're talking, I think people, was, we're talking people like jackie kennedy like the jacqueline kennedy the the first but like bart george and barbara bush um mary tyler moore we used to see her uh, speak a lot um madonna would show yeah. up Cher, sting uh ray charles i got to see ray charles perform like just right close up. Um, 
William F. Buckley Jr. was wow. a, like a famous uh, political mm -hmm. uh, character. Um, you know, so that was like, for me to I was like, I was really young when I saw that, I was so impressed by it. I didn't come from that background. So for me to see that, it was like, just blew me away. Um, and then very often we do private parties in some of their homes. So we'd go out to um, the, some like really old, old blue blooded, like high, like Brooke, Brooke Astor, Mrs. John Hay Whitney, whose family founded the Whitney Museum. Yeah. We were in there, I was in their houses, um, seeing like their, their holiday parties and their weddings and their kids events and things. So I, I just, it's like, the, for me, it was the kind of thing that you would see in movies that I, I just didn't believe was even possibly. Well, absolutely, a completely different world, for sure. So like being, so at that time I was an art student. So I'd go into their houses and see like how they had, like the, the, the buildings that they lived in and the art collections that they had. Um, there was one um, in particular, the when I worked at the Whitney family, they had um, a Picasso there. Like they had a, a series of Picassos, but there was one, it was the boy, blue boy with pipe, which is this like super famous Picasso painting. And I actually saw it like right in front of me in somebody's dining room. Oh. That just like, I, I just never thought I could ever see anything like that. Um, and I knew like uh, while that was going on, like I was working as a helper, as a wallpaper hanger with, with my uncle and his team and, and seeing like a different side of the context because when he, we were working with him, we'd be putting these spaces together. So we never got to see how they were activated after we left. But then I got to see it and, and it just, it gave me a, a fuller picture of, of what I was, could possibly do. Right. Putting these spaces together. So interesting. James, we're gonna go ahead and um, start this presentation and share um, some of your work and also um, share some of the, um, uh, sorry, let me just get here. Some of the, um, uh, you know, some of the things that um, you've encountered during your time in installing uh, wall covering. So um, we're gonna get started with the presentation side of things. Um, but just before we do, uh, we have a poll question for you and you can go ahead. We'd love it if you'd answer the poll, but if you wanna put it in the chat, that's okay too. Um, so the first um, poll question we have for you is what motiv motivated you as our guests today to register for the wall covering webinar? Um, is it to grow your knowledge about wall coverings or um, are you here to kind of learn about wall covering issues and you need solutions? Oh, wow. Resoundingly, just to grow knowledge about wall covering. So no pressure there, James. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. So 90% are here with us today. Thanks everyone for answering that question. Um, to um, really just grow their knowledge about uh, wall covering um, and they, um, you know, they, they want to know about the ins and outs and questions. And I think James is going to answer that for us here today. So um, James, you're looking at the screen, you can see it. To grow your knowledge about what? Yeah. Can you see the, my, um, my um, presentation right now? I can see it's got an overlay of the, the question on top of the Oh, does it? Okay, let me just stop that for a moment and we'll try it this way. That happens sometimes. Okay, let's try it again. How's that? It's still showing up with the questionnaire over on top of oh. your front page. Okay, let's get rid of that. How's that? Right. Gone? Perfect. Okay. So um, tell us about, before we get started, tell us about this image that we're seeing. So this is just a, a, a project that we were doing a few years ago, and it was just a, a beautiful, very simple apartment um, in New York, in 
this was like in a high rise, like maybe like on the 20th floor or something. Um, but this was across from the MoMA Museum. And just the view is just so simple. And we rarely get to get like such a clean square room. I mean, just want to take a picture of our table, like how, you know, I don't know, just to document that. I didn't expect that we'd be using it here, but um, <laughs> it's, kind of, it's kind of a good, it's just a good picture. Like this is a basic, it's kind of an old fashioned setup uh, for a paper hanger to have. Right, right. Um, you know, that's, that's the, it's just a, such a very primary tool to have. Um, but we thought, I thought it was a beautiful picture um, to take. It so. is indeed. Um, so James, before we get to this, so this is obviously one of uh, James's installs and he's gonna tell you about it in a moment, but it actually, we, we now have uh, one more poll question for you. And this question is, um, is this wall covering flawed as you see it or, um, or is that the way it's supposed to look? So you can answer yes or no. For me, Nope, this is for our guests. And there, oh, we have some, it's resoundingly, no, 92% of our guests are saying, no, it is not flawed. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> so th with this, that's great. That's a great response that I'm glad to get. Um, very often lately in, the, in recent years, there are so many, um, the concept of wall covering or wallpaper has changed from the printed flowers and ribbons that'll match together seamlessly to a lot of handmade or or handmade style uh, patterns that when they come together they don't make a perfect seam. And usually, whoever, usually the designer or architect who picks that, they understand that, and they're trying to bring that to their client. Very often, their client doesn't understand that, so it's a communication idea. Of letting them know that like okay this is what it's going to do and that's kind of what's good about it is that to show that it is a handmade product right because i find um I, you know when we explain that up front you know setting the level of expectation is always so much better and to your point when you talk about it being a handmade product and the imperfections are part of the beauty it it, it sounds like it is so exciting and kind of makes it even more special. But when you say that without afterward, when the client thinks that there's a problem because it doesn't look like they thought it was going to look, it feels more like an excuse, right? Um, so I think to your point, James, setting the expectation up front to the customer is, is so, so important. Um, we're going to move to the next slide. And let me just, oops. Okay, tell us about this one. So this was a, a project that we were called to look at. Um, it was a textile and this was a, a, an installation question um, where the installer had, an, it was a, some type of fabric. I'm not, I'm not sure if it was, it was a woven fabric. It could have been a linen or a silk and the client had, or, or the installer had pasted it and the paste came through uh, the silk. So we're trying to decide if it was a, a material flaw or if it was an installation flaw. And I think the jury was never really resolved on this on what it could have been. Um, but there are, it, it tells that fabrics are very uh, sensitive and how they install, then it has to be um, thought about like how the paste is applied, how much water is used, what type of paste. So, yeah. Right. And James, so for something like this, I know often when we encounter um, issues with, um, you know, clients, our clients, um, you know, have experienced these issues with, with you know, their installers. And um, it sometimes can be a little bit of a he said, she said scenario. Um, and so you and I spoke about when we, when we chatted last, how important it is to ensure that you, um, inter instruct the installer to, you know, keep all leftover wall covering. And also, you know, the installer really, when you're, when you're planning 
to um, measure and, and planning out how many roles are needed, you as an installer, you always want to allow a little bit extra. Is that is that true? Yeah, so a, a way that this could have been helped, um, it looks like the room here was probably started from the right corner and the parts were first piece was the right, second and so on. And that's the one with the most of, a, of an issue. So if there's, if there's an extra amount on the project, usually like 20% overage right. for any room, um, very often with these materials, like even a great installer who's been doing it forever still has to learn that specific project, that specific room. Um, and hopefully, I mean, you've hired somebody that's, that can manage it, but sometimes there are concerns like, you don't know that it's going to do this. So the first piece that goes up can be telling you of, of how the material will react. So in this case, I don't, I don't really know, like if they saw that happening and they just continued, but maybe they could have started with another piece to, to improve it. Right, right. So. Oh dear. This is, this is clearly not your work. No, <laughs> no. So I, again, like we, we get a lot of calls from projects that are, have already been completed and, and try to comment on them or try to repair them. Um, this, we really didn't understand what happened. Um, it was, it was a pretty large project and there were like many, like many results like this around the, around the project. Um, what I think happened was that whoever was installing it, just they were overwhelmed by the project and maybe they didn't have enough budget into it. Maybe they didn't thought they didn't have enough time to do it. So they kind of rushed through. And we, we found things like this that were like kind of, this wasn't so easy to find. It was kind of like behind a corner somewhere that was like a little bit, uh, a little bit hidden, but eventually the client found it. And, um, yeah, that would be terrible, especially because you can tell the wall covering is not inexpensive wall covering. And I feel like, you know, um, some of the, the, I know some of the common response is my installer has been doing this for years. But to your point, James, things change and evolve all the time. And we're coming out with new products and new constructions and new materials, um, which keep our industry so incredibly interesting, but also you're learning as you go, right? And so uh, would you say that, um, you know, sometimes it doesn't matter how long someone's been doing something, it's, it's really um, a little bit of trial and error um, as new product comes out? Yeah, there's always a learning curve to it. I mean, there's, there's a very um, basic standard rules to wall coverings, the, the wallpaper, the original wallpapers, the way they were applied, the commercial vinyls, fabrics, the way they were applied. Uh, but lately there's there's more and it's constantly changing. So to take a position, like if you, if you are someone that has a lot of experience, you still always have to keep an open mind that you can always learn the new thing as right. opposed to saying, okay, it has to work this way. There's a problem with the material that's not working. Sometimes the installer actually has to adapt into the material. Um, but it's just looking at this, realizing also, um, the, the craft of installing wall covering is like a very specific craft. And it's often in, in the context of construction industry, sometimes it's overlooked as being like, oh, it's an easy, simple afterthought thing. And we do actually hear very often where a project can be built by someone who's expert at, at all of the other things that, that go into building a building uh, and then they hire somebody that says, oh, well, you know, can you also do the wallpaper? And they're like, oh yeah, sure, I can try it. And then they go <laughs> ahead and do it. And someone who's an expert carpenter or an expert painter, and they kind of get cornered into like doing a project and they're really not, they realize that it is a, it's a full focus craft. Right. So, I mean, that, that might be what happened here. They might've hired somebody else who did everything else. Could have been the same guy that did all the flooring or the stonework or whatever and said, okay, you, you know, can you do this too? Right. And, that they can. We often get calls from, from clients saying like, oh, uh, you know, we tried the wall covering or somebody else tried to do the wall covering. They did the first room. It didn't work out, but they're not really, you know, a full-time paper hanger. Um, so then they, they find out the hard way that they can't get a good, great result that way. Which always amazes me because, um, you know, when you spend 
enough money or you invest in the, in, you know, a beautiful wall covering or your clients investing in wall covering it, to me, it stands to reason that you would invest in the person hanging it. But I think sometimes, you know, the budget gets squeezed and compromises are made in areas where maybe they shouldn't be made. Right. Um, tell us a little bit about this. So here, here's a project that we did and actually turned out it turned out great. It was a beautiful project to do. The house was beautiful. Um, the wall covering, the, the ceiling is plaster, um, but we worked on the walls there, which was a, a um, it was a fleece back upholstery fabric that was designed to look like a leather, like a, I think like an ostrich type leather um, surface. And it was laid into all these wooden frames on the wall, which after it was done, it was great. It took like two weeks to do this room. The downside to it was that we going into the project, um, we we'd done the whole house for this client. And when it came to this room, somehow the communication was missed on what the wall actually was. So we were giving floor plans on this. It was like, okay, this is a room and the room is like, you know, it's. 15 by 20 or something, and here's some material we're going to use. So we calculated like how much time it would probably take. But then when we got to the site, we saw that the, the walls had been all framed out with this woodwork. Thanks. So it just changed the story completely. And it, it, was, it was for a great client. So we committed to finishing the project. But because it was such a different detail than we understood, it just it, it changed the amount of time that we thought it would take I, like I thought it maybe a day or two to do this room, but it ended up taking like five. Right. So it's, it's and the reason why I show this picture is that in at the topic of, of the discussion is like oh things to avoid and one is like real communication. If you're hiring a project to your installer, you should really communicate every detail that you can to them so that they can accurately price the project for you. And if they price the project correctly on what what they need to do the project, you won't have results like we showed in the previous picture of rushed cuts and, and split seams and paste and whatnot. Right. And then, you know, in terms of just overall measurements, um, is there a certain way in, you know, you or, you know, maybe most installers would, would like to get that information for the designer to be able to communicate it to you? Yeah, I mean, the best, most accurate way to to measure a project is if the site is built and you can do a walkthrough. I mean, that's always the easiest way to do it if, if you can get to the site um, because the site is built already. Um, but very often projects, they start on drawings like a room like this. We probably priced it before the room was even built. So right. it starts with architectural drawings. So if, if you can get the drawings, if you at least have a floor plan and if the floor plan is highlighted exactly where the wall covering is supposed to go, not to just say, okay, it's the wall behind the bookshelf. It's you can just simply highlight it. If it's if it's in paper, you could do that. Or if it's on a file, you should be able to highlight that as well. Um, but then the elevations will help. And I think probably for this room, we probably had the floor plans, but we didn't have the elevation. So the elevation helps with accuracy. Um, another thing for uh, paper hangers, like I, I have a lot of experience reading drawings, but I'm not trained as an architect. I'm not trained on CAD. So sometimes a designer is putting together something on CAD, on CAD and they, they transfer it to, to a, a paper hanger or a contractor and say like, okay, here's the file, go look at the file. Now that person who's a tradesperson has to translate your drawing at, right. you know, and, and to figure out like, okay, what's the scale? How do I print this out? Like so many installers that I talk to are like, okay, they want to print this thing out. No matter if you send it on a file or not, I can read it on my computer. I can look at it in Acrobat, whatever. But a printed drawing is sometimes easier for a person who thinks three-dimensionally. Right, right. So in that case, you bring it to a printer and you, and you say, okay, print this drawing out. And then it prints out in a scale, a, like a scale to fit. And in that case, sometimes the scale will get lost. So you don't know how to translate like what is what. So it helps the person who's sending this out, the designer, the architect, if they know the scale on the drawing, they can do a benchmark and say, okay, just at least one, one benchmark saying, okay, this wall is 12 feet across or it's 12 foot four and it's one mark. And then the installer can look at that and correlate everything through the drawing based on that benchmark. 
so that that's one way i mean it's that's like that's one way to do it um but in terms of quantity um it always helps if you know if the designer knows the the material that's being used they need to indicate the width of the material and then the package size of the material so if it's sold in continuous yardages if it's sold in rolls and what does a roll mean a roll might mean five yards it might mean mm -hmm. 10 yards it might mean 11 yards so those those uh, features need to be described to the installer to accurately measure um, right and this project um here is another one and this was uh this was another one that was sent to me. This is a glass bead uh, wall covering that was applied on a ceiling. So this is 54 inch wide glass beads and the span there is probably about 10 feet. And it's actually pretty well, it's it's a fairly good installation, but there are, there are some issues in it, like where it looks like there's some marks in it and like where the seams are visible and then there's a couple marks in it. And the point I wanted to make here is that this one is about expectation. So the client had this vision that they could do this glass beaded ceiling and not really considering to the, the installer that um, these panels, when they're pasted, they could weigh 30 pounds. Right, so, right. So this was, I, you know, again, it's a, it's a communication before hand. And I don't, I, I don't know the whole story of this project, but it, it may have been like the installer got on onto the site and said, okay, they all of a sudden we're installing this, this material and they have to figure out how to do it. And it could have been one installer or two installers, but something like this probably requires a team of two or three installers to bring up, me, meaning having one person on the table and two people up on the ceiling. And, and the third is like as a helper to install this. So one thing that I've talked about is like, with clients, sometimes when there's a material that's really exquisite, it's beautiful material, you have to understand like, what are the limits of where it can be used? Um, and something like this, I, I started, I, I've done several glass beaded ceilings. Um, one thing I'd learned is that a material like this, it, it can be cut into smaller sections and still installed in, in a beautiful way, as opposed to trying to, you know, if it's if it's made in 54 inch wide material, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to install it in 54 inch wide panels. They can be cut down in half, they can be cut down into sections, um, as long as it's laid out in a way that makes sense, usually a symmetrical um, setting. So James, would you say, I mean, I think this is where we run into some problems. I mean, as designers, I mean, I certainly understand um, sometimes there's just lack of knowledge um, because designers just have to know so much about so many things. Um, but would it be useful, especially when they're thinking of some kind of unique projects to bring the installer in prior to even uh, making the final decision on the type of paper? You know, um, does, do you do that often, consultations that way? It, it does help. I mean, I. I have had all types of uh, clients that I've worked for. And earlier on in my career, I would just get kind of called up to do a project. And often the material had been ordered before I got there. It might've been shipped already. We arrive on site and that, that consideration didn't happen. But the further along, most of my like, great clients, they will work with me and, and show me a material and say, okay, this is what we wanna use in this particular room. Right. And it's a question, it doesn't always come up as like, oh, will it work or not? But I, but th there's an openness that if I see the sample as we're measuring it, I can comment on it. And if you're a designer, you're, you're putting a room together, it's helpful to do that. Um, there are often there's, there are materials that are like great, um, but they might, it just not, might not be the right one for that room. Uh, there might be other alternatives that are close enough to it that might even be more attractive for the room. Right. The, the designer might not have, may not have seen. Um, so it's, it's good to communicate that, um, but it's also good to be open-minded on, on how something like, like glass beads is, is like, it's, I mean, there's a lot of like unique materials, but that one, it, it's just like, it's out of the ordinary of typical wallpaper per se. 
So it changes like how it's installed. It's, it's much uh, more deliberate on how you have to make the cuts, how you have to paste it um, and then install it. So I think it's, it's helpful to understand that as the designer or whoever's specking this out. Right. And I know with, um, you know, wall coverings like flock and glass beads, I mean, when you're installing it, you really have to be mindful that there's, um, you don't catch any of the flock or the beads behind the paper upon installation because it can damage if that bead comes through the back, it can, it can be, um, you know, kind of offensive to look at or even damage the, the face of the paper if you've got beads lodged in behind. And that, that's also like an idea is that for an installer, um, I, I, I've been able to meet like many great installers that have been doing it forever. Like you know, and, and after five years, if someone's been working at SETI for five years, they, it, it can, it's a great kind of like skill that they have. 10 years, 15, 20 years after that, they get better um, and more exposed to different materials. But even someone who's been at it for so long still hopefully they would have an open mind to say like okay i'm willing to like consult with another installer and say like okay i'm you know i i don't know this product even though i've i've hung hundreds or thousands of rooms even um you can't possibly have installed every single wall covering and it's it's okay to acknowledge that like for your like if if you're um if you're hiring a wall covering installer it's okay for them to not be the full, you know, to have every single capacity. Um, but if, if you are, if you understand that they still have to learn this product, you know, not, not to dismiss them and say like, oh God, this guy's terrible. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do this one single room. He's got marks on it, but you, you handed him a material that he's never seen before. Right. Um, so it's, it's okay to, to keep that idea that, that they can figure out how to do this and to consult Call the manufacturer up, call them up and say like, okay, do you have somebody that we can talk to there that, that has installed this already? Can you have us walk, have them walk us through it? That's a great idea. Um, now you've got these two images here. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, about each? So this is again, like one, a, a room, these rooms are correctly installed. Um, and the one on the left in particular, um, Again, it's a hand. This was a hand painted foil. I think they, I'm not, they took a foil and they painted like a um, an encaustic on top of it. Mm -hmm. And each panel had a slightly different, like a, a slightly different texture or color to it. Even though it was in the same, it was the same product. They may have been made on different days or it was a different batch. Um, so there was a whole series of panels that were all exactly had the same flow to them. And then there was one uh, set that didn't. And in order to complete, complete the room, they had to be shuffled up in order to actually highlight that change in them. So the way we made this work was just to, to mix them up. And, and you see the, that piece on the left that kind of flashes a little bit more. The, the whole room had that happening throughout it. So we're just like, okay, this one, this one piece is just a little bit brighter. But again, it was the client under, they actually understood this um, to the point for them, it was like, oh, wow, this is great. Like they got it. They're like, okay, this is a unique, a unique material. Right. And that's something that's really key, I think, for designers to understand. And, and you know, when they're interviewing installers or maybe working with installers to ensure that you don't just take one roll and start hanging. And when you're working with these specialty wall coverings that you really do have to open them up see the shade variation and alter it in a way that's aesthetically pleasing in the room. So it's at least the, the shade variation, you can plan it out to your point. So it's kind of more consistently inconsistent, if that makes any sense. So one thing too is uh, for the installers, they don't always understand that either is that like as a, a paper hanger, they act even like it's just burned into my head. Like, okay, we have to make these, these uh, panels go together invisibly. The seam has to be invisible. So that's like the first, like the first hope of like me as an installer. And I, and I think most like paper hangers have that idea. It's like, okay, I want this to go together. I want the seam to be invisible. 
And you have, as the installer, you have to kind of undo that logic or that standard and say, okay, now we're getting things that aren't going to do that. And it's supposed to not be able to do that. Right. Um, so like there's ways to, to compensate that. And was, is one is like how we shuffle the, the panels around. Another one is to do the, all the installations with symmetrical paneling. So instead of counting how many full pieces will go around the room, we'll calculate each wall separately. So each independent wall has a symmetrical install on it. So a room that's however many, um, however many feet across, it'll have five equal panels across it or six or 10 or whatever. Instead of doing the full width of the material all the way across, they're all 54, 54, 54, 54. And at the end, you have like a nine inch orphan at the end that doesn't seem to make sense. I'd rather cut them all down to 40 or 41 or 45 or whatever. So as long as they're all the same across the room. And even in this picture on the right, you see it's like a, a full larger wall. There's the window and then it makes a turn. That little bay is two equal pieces where they were cut, they were cut from a much larger panels to make them equal into that section. Right. And I think that that makes a huge difference on how the install can look in the end. And it's a subtle, it's a subtle thing. Like whoever's using the room doesn't always see that right away. But once you see it, it never goes away. Like if you have these like all these walls are done and all of a sudden you have this little guy at the end, it just doesn't seem to fit. You will never unsee that. That's true. That's very true. Oh dear. Okay. Tell us about this. So this room was like a gold mine in, in what could have been different. Um, <laughs> this was a bathroom um, that was installed over walls that were prepped with probably latex or eggshell paint when it was like, so there was no wallpaper primer. That was the first um, thing about this room that we found we were called in to repair it. Um, the other thing was that the paste that was used was a strippable paste. This was a printed paper. And then the third thing was that there was probably no lining paper on this room. So this was like a classic printed wallpaper that, and, and the other condition was that it was in a bathroom without a window. So I, I don't know, I get, you know, that's like an endless conversation about like, oh, can we wallpaper the bathroom? Um, the answer is yes, with some uh, there's some risk to wallpapering in a bathroom just because it's a it's a right. wet environment right um, but there are ways that you can mitigate the room falling or the paper falling off the wall um, and the first is to really use a wallpaper specific primer um, that is like absolute um, and that's a step that often gets overlooked um, even by you know established people um, so that's like, that's a, something that should always be built into the conversation of having it prepped correctly. Right. Um, and then you mentioned a liner. When do you, when, when would someone need to use a, a wall covering liner? So lining paper is a very old fashioned uh, technique with wallpaper. And the original use for it was that in the older buildings, the walls were made out of plaster before drywall was, was common. Um, and plaster is so dense that it was plaster and then it would ha often have oil paint on top of it. And the adhesives were water-based starch. Usually like in the old days, it was like um, wheat paste, but there are, there are modern versions like uh, ready mix versions that are fairly equivalent to wheat paste. Uh, but wheat paste or, or any like starch-based water glue will not stick to a plaster surface. It'll, it'll stick initially, but eventually it will let go. So the old like way old time installers used to use a, a cross lined uh, blank stock paper, which is similar to like a newsprint paper. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit, it's a little bit um, thicker than a, a newsprint would be. Um, but if it's hung cross lined on top of the prepared wall, it then creates a, a ground for the like the paper traditional paper to uh, bond onto. So the other the other uses of lining paper, which is like what the assumption is like, oh, lining paper will smooth out an irregular wall, which it does to some degree, but that's not the main purpose of it. Mm -hmm. The main purpose is to, to make a better bond. So by installing lining paper in this room in particular, if, it, if they installed the lining paper and they saw that there were adhesion issues with it, they would have seen that 
before they installed the, the more expensive top paper. Right. So that's like just one, I mean, I mean it's, it's, you don't need it with every project, but more like traditional papers is very useful. And then, and that's another thing is like, again, like the cost is always a big deal with any of these projects because the client has a certain budget for it and they're, they're envisioning like, okay, this like, we're just gonna wallpaper this room one time and the, and the installer will give them a price for it. But to do lining paper, it's almost doubling the amount of effort that'll go into the room. Lining paper goes up quick. It doesn't have to be exact on, right. it, it's a cheaper material, but it still is something to consider for the installer. It's like a whole extra, you know, for a room like this, it would have been one day do the lining paper, come back the next day and do the finish. Right, so I guess you have to allow the drying time and- Exactly. So it's, it's definitely, um, and same thing, this, this is just, this was in the same project. This was the room right next to it. Um, it was another bathroom. So it was the same condition where it's a, a closed bathroom that, that gets used a lot. Uh, the ventilation isn't, is either, I'm not sure if it's there or not, um, but it was, it was the same. The walls were not prepped. They didn't use a lining paper. And then the glue might not have been um, a starch-based traditional paste. So having like having seen things like this, um, clients will say like, oh, can I can I do the bathroom? And I, I don't know, I, I think that it's worth it. Like, I don't think that, uh, you know, clients should always like shy away from doing a bathroom. I mean, you just have to understand there's some risk compared to like another room, like a dining room, living room, bedroom, whatever. Um, bathrooms and kitchens are a little trickier. The conditions are a little bit more um, hostile to wallpapers. Um, right. I would say in my experience is if it's prepared properly, 90% of the time, you don't really have an issue. But I, the only time I find where it hasn't been, uh, where it's been an issue is, first of all, you can't use anything that's natural because you'll, you can get mold development and so on and so forth. And, um, but also, um, to your point, you know, if you use a proper prep and you do lining and it's well ventilated, then chances are you're not going to have an issue unless, you know, you've got an area where the paper is overlapping itself or something and it's not adhering to itself versus the wall or, or whatever. But um, next one. So what's happening here? So this was another, another textile uh, where we, think that it had been, um, that paste had gotten onto the front of the wall covering and they tried to wash it. And it, it, when they washed it, it stained it. So that's just a, I mean, it's just a concern, um, you know, with textiles to try to work clean with them. Um, and, and seeing something like this, like where they, they tried to wash it in spots. I mean, sometimes it, it happens. There's glue on, on the front of material like this. Um, and I, I've said that we can actually just wash the whole thing instead of trying to spot clean it, mm. you wash it from either the edge of the corner of the panel from, you know, each seam inside, wash the whole, the whole strip all the way down, or it's a small enough wall to wash the whole wall. So it's, I, I mean, even great installers will get, it'll, you'll get paste on, on things sometimes. Um, right. It's just a matter of how you manage it. And like, so I've, I've been able to come into rooms like this and actually rescue it. Like in, uh, the client thinks they've lost it, but sometimes you can just wash it. Even a delicate fabric. Um, the, the wisdom is to never wash, never apply water on, on the face of something. Mm -hmm. Sometimes with a situation like this, you have to. Um, so that was what I advised to them was just wash the whole wall. And then I didn't, uh, I, I don't think I had, there was a follow-up photograph of this but I think it that's, a great, that's actually a great tip and I, I had never thought of that but what a great tip because then at least it's all going to look you know consistent anyway so mm -hmm. I, I learned that trick from an upholstery uh, person um, they they were working uh, they were called in it was another great house and they were called in to um, to check out like a couch or something and it was uh, the cushions were made out of silk and someone had dropped some food on one of the cushions and the client was like, oh, we have to, um, maybe we have to reupholster this whole thing. And it was, it was, the cost was like, you know, more than they really wanted to spend. 
So the, the guy who was doing the upholstery was called in and said, well, just get me a glass of, uh, of, water, of uh, distilled water. Or like he bought a bottle of distilled water and he just uh, cleaned the one silk cushion and he got the stain out of it. But he cleaned, instead of doing spot cleaning, he cleaned it edge to edge. And it might change the size, it might change a little bit of how the fabric works, but since the whole thing is being changed uniformly, it, they, he was able to rescue it. Right, and you wouldn't get that little ring stain either of the water stain, just if you're spot cleaning, which I know can happen with silk and most likely these types of wall coverings as well. Most textiles are, um, even wall coverings will have a sprayed sizing and sometimes even the distributor doesn't always know that that's happening. Like when, it, when something is made at, at the mill, they'll very often spray it, whether it's like a fire spray or sometimes they spray like some type of um, preservative sizing on top of a fabric. It's just like when you buy a new garment, you wanna wash it because it has that kind of um, chemical thing on it. But wall coverings will have that too. So if you try to wash something, you'll actually remove that sizing only in that one spot and that's how it leaves that ring. Right, oh, smart. Mm -hmm. so, so it takes a little nerve sometimes to like, it, it, I get called into projects to like correct something. And it's like, you, there, sometimes you have to like bend the rules. Like, okay, you're not really supposed to do that. You're not supposed to apply water onto, onto this expensive fabric, but sometimes you have to, and it's better than condemning it. Right, it. right. Um, now we get to move on to your beautiful work of all things beautiful where there's nothing wrong. And this is stunning. So this is a dining room. Yeah, this was a dining room that we did for our clients. Um, this is, I think it's a Degorne, um, which is like a hand painted. Uh, it's a, I, I guess it's like a gouache painting that's on top of foil. And it's kind of, it's a very like classic look. I've actually gotten to install this pattern a few times uh, for different clients. And um, it's just like something like this. It's just takes a lot of patience to do. Um, and just a lot, it's just like each, each panel is its own thing. Wow, stunning. Yeah. Ooh, that, this looks interesting. So tell us about, is that an arch? It's actually curved inside? Yeah, so this was a kind of like a, I think it was like a dressing room for a client and they had these niches cut into the wall that were, there was actually nine or 10 feet high. Um, but it was, it was a pattern that like, again, like the room seemed like a simple room and the material was relatively kind of predictable. I don't wanna say it was easy, but it was a predictably going uh, material to install and then they had these domes and on the first look I did, I thought okay the dome I, don't, I didn't really know how we were going to solve it how we were going to get them covered um, but what we did was we we installed everything kind of traditionally coming around the corners and then when we got to the top we just started cutting like doing like overlapping the pieces and cutting them to reduce them to fit the curve wow if I sent you another picture, are you, okay, that's the, the start. There might've been another picture in there that was like kind of underway, um, but this took like yeah. hours and hours to do that. So it was like, you know, if you question again, is like if you're installing, if you're hiring an installer, you want someone that's really patient that can really spend the time with your material. I can't even imagine. And it, I mean, it looks so perfect, especially going circular with squares wouldn't be because yeah. you'd want to keep those level as you're going. I mean, it would be really tricky. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's definitely not perfect. I mean, if you look at it really close, the squares are not always exactly the same. Just the way that a dome works, it collapses in a way that, I mean, for a paper, for someone who's like not trained, like as someone, an architect would, would draw this, this uh, design out and then you hire someone who's a tradesperson who doesn't have that training to try to understand like like maybe someone who's laying installing bricks or tiles might have a, a different understanding of this but like someone who's applying paper and fabric and vinyl like it's just a totally different um, it's just a, a different concept for them to grasp 
Right. So I think if you can hire somebody that that can actually bend into that it, and you'll have a, a good job come out. Oh, this looks interesting. Is that fabric? That is a, a mylar that that it's like pressed with an embossing to look like um, to look like chrome, I guess. Wow. That's beautiful. This is a closet or a dressing room. It's like a dressing room. So they took uh, a wall covering. The wall covering was like, again, it was like a really beautiful space. And they, they kind of like went all out on so many of the finishes there. Uh, but instead of doing the whole room with a wall covering like this, they just used it as like small feature details and it looked great. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, this is a little harder to see, probably just the lighting, but um, do you want to tell us about this one? So this was a grass cloth. Like this, this was where kind of the craft really comes into it. This was a just a plain grass cloth and the client had picked it out um, and they wanted to do it in a grid pattern. So we cut, we measured everything out and, and balanced all the pieces to fit symmetrically, cut them into squares and then turned each one uh, to fit wow. them in. And it changes like from the view that you have, just like uh, any textile wall covering, when you're looking at it straight on, if you turn it 180 degrees or if you turn it like 90 degrees, I guess, um, it changes the whole way the light hits it, the texture and everything. So these are actually the same color. I mean, it's actually, it was all taken from the same material, uh, but it reads as a different color when you change the direction of it. Yeah, oh, that's really lovely. As is this. Now, is this a mural? It's another hand-painted mural. This is um, another gua. It's painted with gouache onto a um, a rice pa a rice paper backing. Wow. So and this. So when you're when you're, you know, using pattern like this too, I know how important it is, and I think that's where you know, you get a really seasoned installer versus someone to your point who says, yeah, I do painting, but I could probably put that up for you as well. Um, so it's not just about matching seams, it's about you know centering the pattern for the space, correct? Yeah, so a, a, a material like this one is go, there's a lot of planning involved with something like this. Um, the drawing, the, the design is unique. It's, it's, it's comes from a, a, a studio, um, it's like a, a standard, but then they'll, they'll um, customize it to the room. So if, if you're ever doing like murals like this, you can you can do it with a drawing and lay the drawing out and it'll be made to that that room. But if you're if you're measuring for something like this, you should always actually have you still the concept of having more material. So instead of it, it can be it can be made exact to the room. But as an installer, it's always nice to have a little extra insurance. So to say like, okay, it's gotta be exactly made to that. I always ask my clients to actually take something like this and do make it bigger than the actual room by at least, um, you know, at least a few inches. That way there's room to push it around because you might not see in, in the first planning, like this one has the sconces, you might not see that the lamps go, they might cut into a significant part of the drawing. Right. So as the installer, you wanna be able to shift that a little bit to accommodate that. Right. So that's just uh, another concern. Now, this one, ha murals like this, they do take a lot of care where the, the preparation should be a level five uh, skim coat. Then very often they'll use a canvas liner, then a paper liner on top of that. And those, again, like those expenses build up to the client. And if my feeling is like, if, if you're going to put the effort into having like such an exquisite piece of artwork put up in your space like this, go with all the preparation that it takes to get there. Mm -hmm. might, the preparation might actually end up costing more than the actual mural, but it's worth it in the end. Something like this could last, you know, as long as the house will, will last. Right, that's stunning. Um, and now the lighting is a little um, hard to see here, but this is similar, uh, obviously a different drawing, but similar concept. Similar concept, it's a hand painted mural um, and a room like this is, a, it's a small room, which if like, say if it was done with a, a grass cloth or, or some other paper before it could be like, 
you know, a day or two with a, a good fast installer, but something like this takes two weeks to do. Wow. And it's just endless patience to get through a room like this. So it's like, as, as the client, if they understand that, that there's something like this will take a lot of time, then they understand, they'll appreciate the cost for it. Mm -hmm. Oh my, wow. So tell us about this. So here was a house that we worked in and they had a um, very high scale uh, ceilings. The ceilings were like sometimes 30 feet in, in this project. And they wanted to have the ceilings look like they were wood paneling. So they found a, a wall covering that, that had a great convincing wood grain on it. So we installed this around the house and these, this just to show the scale, I don't know, this could have been like a 20, 20 or 30 feet across. Um, so we, we cut all these panels up. We had a team of two guys on the floor and four up on the ceiling working for this. And then we had like, we had to like have a tender. We had somebody bring them up to us and- um, Oh my gosh, wow. Yeah, so it's, it's possible. And here's the same project. Um, this is another, another room. That is stunning. Wow, that is- and That's all paper, that's all printed paper. So did you, you had to cut it, you had to miter all of those. Yeah, so this is a three-dimensional, um, I, don't, I don't know if it's a dome, I guess it's a dome. I don't know what type of dome it is, but it's, it's got these angled uh, corners in it. So we had to cut each one as they went. And one thing that I, I wanted to do with this was to show that the, the wood can change in texture so that the, it's a printed faux, faux bois, printed faux wood. Um, and you can see like it had like a consistency through it. And one, one of the ways to do it would have been to continue the pattern around. So it really constantly, it doesn't change, but I thought it'd be great to highlight the facets mm -hmm. by, by pushing the dark and the light. So, you, so they didn't always line up in these edges and it would look more authentic. Mm. You know, it's, it's printed paper. So we wanted it to look like authentic mm -hmm. wood and real wood isn't, it's not perfect. You, there's so much nuance in it. So we wanted to highlight the nuance. So that's how we did the banding. Oh, that's amazing. And this is a, is that grass cloth on the ceiling? This is grass cloth. And this project, um, this was for, this was in a residence. The owner, um, he had this like great art collection and, and um, he, would use his apartment to he was he's a unique guy like he um he's a business guy but he he's got all these um he owns a bunch of hotels and he does his own kind of like design and he'll yeah. test out his designs in his own residence so his apartment is like constantly changing on what he'll do there so this he wanted to like okay he wanted this like kind of like rustic look so he found this grass cloth that was totally raw like it had no ink on it it, it just like looks so like almost like primitive. So when the bolts came, when the rolls came from this, they were all over the place in terms of coloring, which we didn't know. Like when, or he didn't know even when he planned the project. So, okay, so what will we do with this? So we started, we started laying, like we cut full panels and the, each panel would be so different from the next one. So we decided that we would play it up even more. So instead of doing full long runs with it, we cut, the, each panel, we would cut it into um, sections were like three feet, five feet, four feet, and then in, inconsistently, so we could shuffle them around. So we kept like some linear, we kept like some line, linear pattern to it, but then within each line, we broke it up into these randomized sections. And so we really played up like the randomness of it. It was yeah. all over the place, but it looked so great. Mm -hmm. And, and so, this one. So here, so this seal, so we actually did the ceiling. So the wall, so this was another project uh, for, for another client. Um, th this is not actually, it's a, it's a silver leaf that we did up there. Um, so they, the client had a, this, a plaster, they had, they bought this lamp and they wanted to feature it. So the whole room was built around the lamp basically. Wow. Uh, they wanted to, to, to have a, a ceiling for it. And they couldn't find a wall covering. So we ended up doing a silver leaf for them. 
on top of this. And it was, it was plastered, it was uh, smoothed out. Um, so they're like, I mean, we have capacity to do that, to do like some print, like I'm not, there's, there's some really great guild, we're not gilders, but we can do like a very basic type of gilding. Wow, that's incredible. Oh my goodness, so much. I'm gonna stop sharing so people can see you and we can get to some uh, some questions. Wow, I mean, just absolutely incredible. Your knowledge is extensive. I think we have to have you back for another session at some point because we just couldn't cover it all. But honestly, James, I mean, just, and there's so much to consider, you know, for a designer. And it's just so incredibly important that they hire you know, an installer that they trust and can feel comfortable with. I'm going to get to some questions here. Um, I'll go to the Q&A first. There's one there, but I believe there's more um, in the chat. So let's start um, with the um, uh, question. So Jennifer is asking, um, was the dome spec um, an overlook from the designer uh, and then you needed to make it work? So I guess the wood. No, they were very deliberate about that. Yeah. Is that if it's about the wood? No, they were so calculated on that. Um, the decision to do like I, there are some designers that if I if I build a relationship with them, they'll they'll let they there it's their design, and I have to I always respect their design. They're in charge of it, but my goal is always to try to make their concept work. Right, right. So, like that, it was it wasn't an overlook. It was. Um, it was very, very deliberate, I thought. Deliberate. Now, Bessie, Becky's asking if you um, cover um, outlets. So I guess for electrical and so on, do you typically cover those on the wall or how does that? So, so outlets is like, really, outlets are a pain, really. Yeah. Anytime we have to wrap any type of fixture, um, there's layers to that of why it, can be done and why it shouldn't be done. Um, the first thing is that technically to code in most regions, we're probably not supposed to do that because an electrical outlet cover is something that's rated by with, you know, within in fire ratings and then there's an insurance rating for it. Um, so technically we're usually really not supposed to do that. Can we do it? We do. And we get asked a lot to do it um, design wise. For the client, I get it, you know, to, to kind of blend it in more. Right, right. It's in, in a way it's, it's um, you know, it takes some practice to do it. You can't do it with every material. Mm -hmm. Thinner and more flexible the material, yes, but sometimes um, you know, like for grass cloth, like sometimes some things just won't work on it. Right. Um, there's different tricks. You can use a spray adhesive. You can prime it with like a like a clear sticky primer and then try to glue it. You can wrap them with tape, you can cut them out. Um, but sometimes there are clients that will have a, a decorative painter and they will they can blend them in that way also. Right. So I don't know, aesthetically, like it's, it's nice, but it's, I don't know, it's not, I don't know if it's always necessary. Um, so Victoria is asking, actually, we have two um, kind of similar questions. So um, Victoria is asking the best way to find a great installer in a town where the designer hasn't worked before. Um, and then Laura is asking, saying she's lost her installer to retirement. So how do you go about finding a trusted installer? So I think it might be kind of the same answer. Yeah, I mean, word of mouth is good. I mean, ask around, you know, if, if you're in a room and you see that it's done a nice job you can always ask and and very often if if the client if the, if they're happy with it and it's a durable install they probably would remember who did it i mean that's that's one way to start i mean i, I think that word of mouth is helpful right um, what about the wall covering association there's there's the paper hangers guild that the wall covering um association they're great i i'm not part of them but i do know people there um my, I said my brother's in the business. He was part of it for a while. So I've met a bunch of them and they have a great network on how you find installers regionally. I know that they're in the US and in Canada. So that's a good place to start. They're, they're usually very well vetted um, and, and they'll, it's kind of like peer review to some degree. So they'll kind of endorse each other on who's good. And sometimes even you can contact 
even like for myself, like I, I, we will travel sometimes with clients. Like they say, okay, do, you know, can you travel to X place? And right. Oh, you, know, you know, sometimes it's worth it to them to, to have that. And that, you know, it's as an installer, it's kind of exciting to take a road trip, honestly, <laughs> but, but often, you know, like you, you can, where you are, like chances are we all kind of, it is even though not being part of that guild, like I do know many installers. So we do network with each other. So I can say like, okay, I know a guy that's, uh, you know, in that area that you could call contact. Right, right. Um, so those are, oh, we have one more question here. I thought we were done. Um, so if, if a man, you're, I guess this goes for everything. Um, Becky's asking if a manufacturer, you know, suggests a liner, should you always go with that? what the manufacturer's suggestions are. I do, I, th that's, that's a hard question to answer. And I know like with every, for me as an installer, I, every time I open up a material, I read the instructions if I haven't seen it before. And even if I have seen it, I'll read it. Um, it's not, as an installer, you don't always have to follow it word to word uh, because sometimes you might know something that they didn't they didn't put in the instructions mm -hmm. um, and sometimes the instructions might be written without like a full i don't say like to say this the wrong way but it's not always understood that the conditions on the job site might change that you right. might not need a liner um, there are some products that that are similar from brand to brand that you can find and they might have a different strategy on how to install it. So I, I think the installer often has to make that discretion. But I think if if they if it's advised by the manufacturer, it's helpful to follow that specifically if there's lining paper. But there are ways that the wall can be prepared to over, you know, to, to compensate for that as well. Right. Okay. Um, um, I have another one um, asking about um, how to temper a client's expectation when it comes to seams. I mean, I feel like maybe we kind of covered that in the beginning a little bit. I don't know that it was about seams necessarily, but just kind of the overall look of these natural covering wall coverings. Yeah, I, I think that that's a big thing that I that I've learned, and and we we did talk about it a little bit. W one thing again, like as an installer, I I have like a very um, the, we talk a lot, like the training that I had were with all these these installers that had been working for so much, you know, they'd been working for 30 and 40 years and, and they had seen like the curve of trends of, of what comes in and out. Um, the old papers, and, and when I when I meet just people that have friends and, and different places and they're like, oh, what do you do for a living? I'm, I'm a paper hanger. And they go, oh, uh, I hear it so often. It's like, oh, you know, wallpaper is coming back. I'm like, well, I've heard that for 25 years. Wallpaper is coming back. It's always coming back because it never really went away. It's just the idea of like your granny's like flowery wallpaper that she had in her dining room. Um, that that type of prints, I mean, those are actually that is coming back. You know, yeah. <laughs> come and gone a couple of times in my career. Right. Um, but the old expectation was that okay, the flowers line up. And then hopefully the seam is invisible and you have this like a fantasy world of like, you know, ribbons and bows or whatever, polka dots, anything in your room and it looks great and, and you don't see the parts of it. But the more exotic the materials get, the idea of like showing the seam actually sometimes is the highlight of the room. And when I, the when I actually learned that was not with wall coverings, it's with the other things in a building. And very specifically, I, I was on a project one time where the client installed a silk, it was like a handmade silk carpet. And the carpet was made on a loom that was like 25 inches wide. So the carpet installer came in and he was sewing these panels of silk carpet together across the room. And when he was done, he saw all the bands of it. And at that point, I'd been working for about seven or eight years. And I was like, spent every day pulling my hair out, trying to get the seam more perfect <laughs> over that. And I saw this guy installing this carpet and you could see the parts of it so explicitly. And I was like, 
that's what's actually really great about his work or, or you know that finish and then and then i started realizing looking around the room you see like people install wood floor and like okay this floor is so beautiful it's wood it can be oak or pine or it could be like walnut or cherry or whatever some exotic wood and you see all the pieces of it and then you look at the other parts you look at the marble or the stone around the room is like okay or the bricks everything comes together in parts it's like why can't wall covering be like that I think we have in our minds because you know we can manufacture so much as humans to be at to make it as perfect you know um but in, in, and so I think that's why people struggle with some of this um, product because it's not, the, the perfection is in the imperfection. And I think people have a really hard time getting their, their head around that, but I, I couldn't agree more. That's what makes it so unique and beautiful and, you know, um, and interesting really. There, there's nuance to it. And, I, and I'm, I'm sure I, who, who's, whoever's viewing this today is very often is like designers and they probably already get that but sometimes your client doesn't get that. So right. as a designer or an architect, you're trying to give your client something that will elevate their status a little bit or elevate their environment. And it, when you're in their home or their office or wherever it is that they're gonna use the space that you're building for them, if they understand that their space is unique, like it's, it's, a, it's something that is a special, like it took extra effort to make their room it elevates the value of it for them, not just like about the money, but it's about like, you know, like their own ego is like, okay, I'm in this like really cool room, you know, and, and it's, and here's like this wall covering is like, it's got these like little nuances in it that, that indicate that it's not a copy of something. It's like the authentic original article, which you can actually do with manufactured products too. You can do it with like a handmade product, but you could also do it with like a commercial vinyl, like, and say so like, okay, the way you install it is like this thing is tailored and it's made specifically for here. I think that that just makes the room more enjoyable. It makes like you want to be like live in this room and you want to like accomplish great things in your room. If it's just this like surface that just like is just continuously consistent and it's it, there's a blandness to it. Um, not that that like so this place is for that too, but like in, if when you when you see products that come together in parts like that, if you can understand that, if you can convey that to your client, they'll have more confidence in in the room itself. So, right. oh my gosh, the questions are endless. I could go on. Um, we can certainly circle back to some of the questions we didn't get to. Um, but uh, James, I mean, oh my gosh, you're gonna have to come back. There's just no question. You're gonna have to join us again. I know people who missed out will definitely wanna join the next one. Um, you really are a true artist, um, just incredible your work. And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and joining us here today. And um, yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me. I'm so flattered. I'm, I'm, I really appreciate your attention with this. No problem. And for those of you who joined us, thank you so much. We know we ran over, but you've stayed with us, which is awesome. Um, and, you know, stay tuned. We do have a wall covering CEU coming up in the next, which talks about specialty wall covering. So we're going to be elaborating a little bit more on what James has been saying today and um, all in time for our wonderful wall covering launch in um, March. So thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you soon. Keep safe and keep healthy and choose wallpaper. Choose <laughs> wallpaper, right, every room. There you go. James, thank you again so much. We'll talk to you soon. All thank the you. best. Okay, bye-bye.